but we're going to move directly on with section 5.3, which looks at remote desktop. So the first thing we're going to have to do, as you can see in the task, is Andy has to actually simulate having a client on his machine. You with me? It's not good him having a server, because if you're sitting on a laptop in your office as the network administrator, do you run server on your computer no. at a cost of £500 approximately for the license? No way. You obviously, you run Windows XP, don't you? Or Windows 2000, possibly. Hope you don't run 95 or 98 or something <laughs> like that. I'd be really disturbed if you did. Obviously, you're less likely to have XP. So we're going to get this situation in place. We're going to pretend that my machine, well, my machine is the server. You don't have to pretend it is. It is the server. But we're going to actually get Andy's machine rebooted into XP. So he's going to have to install XP now. So those of you watching on Smart Learn, you'll notice that this is the first part of the actual task. It's task 5.3.2, using remote desktop to manage a server machine. First thing you've got to do, on your second server machine, in other words, in, my, in our case, Andy's machine, he's going to install Windows XP uh, onto a 10 gig NTFS D drive. We're going to call it Client C2, as opposed to Server C2. Remember our naming conventions at the beginning of the course? Yeah. He's now going to become a client. And to be honest with you, for the majority of the rest of the course, Andy's going to be acting as the client to my server machine. Because that's what's going to happen in the real world, isn't it? You're not all going to be using servers everywhere across the world. He's also going to set the administrator password with just a bog-standard password, so it'll match up with my machine and so on. Okay, guys, obviously, what, what, while Andy's installing Windows XP, what I need to do is a very highly complex um, set of actions on my machine to get my machine capable to run a remote desktop. Obviously, what I'm going to do is allow Andy to connect through to my machine and manage my machine. Massive process we need to go through now. You ready? I need to click on Start button. I need to right-click on my computer, go down to Properties. Go to Remote tab and tick this box. And we're ready to go. That's it. Done. The server has now been prepared. Not an overly complex procedure to go through on the domain controller, is it? Or on any server machine. You just go to the system properties, click on the remote tab, put a tick in that box, and you've now said to this computer, anyone tries to come in, assuming they authenticate and they've got the relevant username, password, and rights, and all that business, then let them in. Yeah? Make sense? Uh -huh. yeah. Dead easy. You also have the ability to click on this button here and select additional remote users. Notice the administrator will already have access. The whole of the domain administrator group will have access to the uh, remote desktop. And you also have another group called remote desktop users. Now, remote desktop users can have access to serve machines, but not domain controllers. Only administrators group can have access to domain controllers. Okay? So you can change that if you want. It's just another user right that you can configure. But we don't need to add anyone because Andy's actually going to connect to my machine as the administrator. Cool. So I am basically done on here. Okay, so Andy's got his machine up and running. He now just needs to join the domain. Right then, Andy. What I'd like to do now is join the domain, if you would, please. You don't actually have to do this, to be honest with you, but we're going to do it just so we have some consistency going on here as well. So Andy's going to do a normal process for joining the domain. And in doing so, he's actually going to use a user account to connect through to the domain. So just to give you a little rundown of what actually happened whilst uh, we were off camera, Andy installed Windows XP, and he did nothing aside from put the standard drivers on, just like we've done in previous courses. The only thing he did do extra is he just made sure that his preferred DNS server was my server address. Because obviously, as soon as he tries to connect to a domain, it's going to query the DNS server, which happens to be my machine. Make sense? But that's all he did. There's nothing special about his installation at all. Okay, Andy, so you've got username Dave with a password of presumably just password, all in lowercase, which yeah. is my account. Remember, this is a user account on my local on my domain. Simple, bog-standard user account with no rights whatsoever. In fact, let me prove it that to you. Because this is a major change since Windows 2000. So if we take a look at my screen, we've got Active Directory Users and Computers. Inside Users, we've got the Dave account. Notice that Clive's appeared now. Yeah, replications occurred, so Clive's appeared now. If I go to Dave, double click on Dave, and then the member of tab, you can see he's only in domain users and users. So he's a normal bog standard user. Okay. So Andy, using that Dave account, if you can just hit OK there. It'll take a few seconds for it to connect to DNS, get the DNS server name, talk to it and do everything it needs to do. And of course when he's joined the domain, what's he gonna have to do to his computer? Restart. Restart. So we've got the welcome to the Group C domain message there. It's a very um, happy message, that one. The amount of problems that occurred joining computers to a domain, especially in an old NT4 environment, was a nightmare. And especially if you're going over multiple network links with routers and all sorts of weird and wonderful things happening, it can often be problematic to join a domain. So when you see that message, it's very reassuring. So click OK there, Andy. 
because it means you fixed everything, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have experienced of adding this stuff. I've had similar problems when you yeah. try to connect to computers to the domain. Okay, so Andy's going to reboot his machine now. Obviously, he can't complete this process until he reboots his machine. And now what I'm actually going to do, Andy, is boot you off your machine, if you would. Because I'm going to pretend, obviously, that I'm the administrator of what my server. So what I'd like to do, Andy, is quickly stand up. I've obviously got the dual boot screen here, so I'm going to boot into Windows XP. Uh, excuse me, Dave. What about the DNS suffix? Didn't he have to do that before he joined the domain? No, because one of the things it will do automatically for you is when you actually join the domain, it will automatically grab the DNS suffix and bring it to your machine. I'll show it to you right now. If I log on to this computer... Obviously, I'm using an account with administrative rights on the machine. So, administrator password of group C, because obviously these are the credentials for the domain administrator account. So, I'm logging on. So, this is a similar thing to what you do in a corporate environment. I'm a, an administrator of the network, and I'm sitting at my XP machine, but obviously my intention is to administer my servers. The last thing I want to do is continually get up and go to the server machines and so on. I want to do it all from where I'm sitting. So, cool. Let's just check that thing we were talking about with Chris first off. So, if I go start, right-click my computer down to Properties. Computer name. Notice that the fully qualified domain name has all automatically been added here. Yeah. Yes. So we've got the group C.com. If we go to change and then more, it's all because of this tick box here. Change primary DNS suffix when domain membership changes. So if I move to a different domain now, then it would change to that domain and so on. Obviously, if that had not been ticked, then when I joined the domain, it wouldn't have happened. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay. Now then, what I need to do is use remote desktop to connect through to my server machine, which obviously I'm pretending is a server machine sitting in either a locked server room somewhere, maybe in the same building, or perhaps it could be in a complete different part of the country. Last thing you want to do is continue to go to these places. So all programs, accessories, communications, remote desktop connection. Obviously it's installed by default on an XP machine. And here we get the basic screen, which is pretty much all we looked at when we were doing this on an XP course. But what I want to show you is these additional options. So if I click on this options button here, these pop-ups go away. If I click on this options button here, you'll see there's loads of stuff we can do. And this is where the real fun starts. Because you've got here several tabs that you can actually control what you want to happen. First thing, obviously I've got to put the computer name in that I want to connect to. So what's my computer name? Server, Server C1. Server C1. My fully qualified domain name? .groupc.com Cool. .groupc.com Username is administrator, password is password so I can connect as a different user. Remember what I said about the fact that Microsoft recommends you log on as a normal user, and then when you want to do administrative stuff, then you log on to, and do that particular action as an administrator. Make sense? Cool. So domain is just groupc.com. And that's pretty much um, sta uh, standard stuff. We've got a computer name, the username, password, and domain of who we're actually going to log on. But these tabs are the real cool ones. We take a look at display. We can adjust the screen size that we want the actual window to be. Do we want it to be full screen or do we want it to be less? So perhaps do we can reduce that. Okay then. Now I've actually got a very high resolution, here, well a very low resolution here. Obviously so it's nice and clear for those people watching on smart loans. So this isn't going to make much difference to my machine is it? But if I was running on a, a 1024 by 768 screen, obviously this would now appear as a little window as opposed to full screen. But, so you can play around with that. You can also play around with colours if you want to adjust the colours coming to your machine. Why do you think this would be a benefit to lower the amount of colours coming to your machine? Network traffic. Network traffic. Precisely, network traffic. If you've got this happening perhaps over a very slow link to a computer in the, you know, the remote Hebrides or something, you know, in, in Scotland, then the last thing you want to do is have a really, really dragging all of the real in-depth colours to your machine. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how good it looks. All you want to do is administer the computer. So you can select different colours if you want. And we've got a nice fast network in here, so I'm just going to leave it at 16-bit. Local resources, and this is really clever. Remote computer sound. Any sounds that happen on the remote machine, do you want them to happen on your machine? That's fun. Um, keyboard, do you want stuff to happen here as well? Apply Windows key combinations. But these are the real kiddies. Look at this, disk drives. I'm going to tick this one to show you what this one does in a second. But this is literally going to make my disk drives available to me as I'm managing the other machine. I'll show you what that means in a second. Another couple of ones. Programs. Start the following program connection. If I want something to happen when I connect, then that will run it there. Experience. Do I want to change anything in here? Do I want to allow the following to bring the desktop background to my computer? It's not a big deal, is it, if you bring the desktop background to your machine, but it could possibly be. A particular habit which I used to always do, which isn't necessarily something I'm recommending, it's just something I always used to 